Hello and welcome to today's webinar featuring Claudia Bagney and Claire Cameron, Engagement Editor from Spectrum, the home for Autism Research News, previously found on Safari.org. We'll kick things off in just a moment, but first, uh, know that we'll be fielding questions at the end of today's presentation, but you can ask them any time during the session. To do so, you just submit them via the chat window to the left of your screen. And as always, I'll note that if there are any members of the press tuning in, you can only report information presented during this webinar if that material has already been published elsewhere or if you have first obtained express written consent from the presenter to do so. Claudia Bagni joins us today from Lausanne, Switzerland, where she has recently moved to the University of Lausanne to become Chair of the Department of Fundamental Neuroscience. Dr. Bagni is also a professor at the University of Rome, Tor Vergata. Dr. Bagney's work focuses on understanding brain development and conditions such as fragile X syndrome and autism. She has published seminal work on the molecular basis of dysfunction of neuronal junctions called synapses in both of these neurological conditions. Dr. Bagney serves as a board member of several international scientific organizations and research institutions, including the European Research Council, Leibniz Institute for Neurobiology, and Institute Pasteur. She has received several awards, including the Queen Elizabeth Foundation Award, the Bar von Giesel de Mays Prize, and the Union Chimique Belge Award. She is an honorary member of the Italian Fragile X Association. In 2011, she was elected member of the European Molecular Biology Organization, and we're very grateful that Dr. Bagney has agreed to present some of her work today. Welcome, Professor Bagney. So welcome uh, um, to all of you. Um, all of you, thank you for tuning in. Thank you, Claire, and thank you, Christina and Ingrid, um, for helping me setting up uh, this challenging webinar. Um, so today, I'm going to take you through what has been uh, our main interest over the last 15 years, which is trying to understand the cellular and molecular basis of intellectual disabilities. So our work has largely focused on uh, fragile X syndrome, and over the last few years, uh, we became more and more interested in understanding also uh, the molecular mechanism behind all infection disorders and schizophrenia. So, um, what I would like to share with you today is, is maybe a different perspective, uh, the, the way we look at intellectual disabilities, and is the RNA cytoskeleton perspective. Um, and and try to see this here. Okay. So, in particular, what we are interested in is trying to understand which molecules and pathways make those diseases as fragile X, autism, schizophrenia, psychotic disorders, aging and epilepsy, as well as cancer, different, but for some aspects, similar at the same time. Today, I will not have time to uh, touch base on cancer, but uh, I'll be happy to take any questions related to this aspect, because we and others have seen that there is an inverse correlation between cancer incidence and intellectual disability. So before I start discussing um, uh, our research interests and, and how we uh, contributed to the field, I would like to give you a snapshot of who is really uh, doing the experiment in the lab now. And, and then at the end, I will also summarize the great PhD a postdoc that contributed to the work that, uh, um, that I'm going to show you. So this is our lab. And uh, um, I'm very grateful to them for their enthusiasm and excitement about science. Uh, and uh, we use two model systems, the mouse model and the fly model. And of course, I'm extremely grateful to the patients that, uh, and, and the families that have been uh, very collaborative over the last 15 years with our um, research. Um, so we started really trying to be interested in the cellular and molecular studies, and then we moved over the years trying to understand the circuitry and the synaptic dysregulation that is 
present in, in model system for intellectual disability, namely mice and flies, and then how this uh, impairment may affect behavior in those model systems. And of course, with the ultimate goal is to try to design a compound uh, to ameliorate at least some of the deficits that we can observe and validate those compounds. So um, uh, we all know that uh, intellectual disabilities are some of those due to genetic mutations. So there are, there are genetic risk factors and genetic mutations. We also have to keep in mind that there is a whole series of events that, that contribute in developing the way we are, which are the environmental uh, factors. And they can be positive as well as negative. So we have to consider also the risk that environmental factor adds to uh, the landscape of, of, a, of a genetic background. And then we have a variety of clinical features. So uh, some of the neurodevelopmental um, disabilities are, are clearly have a cognitive impairment, so they have social impairment. We will touch base on this at the end. Um, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder and anxiety and mood dysregulation. So it's a combined um, a complex uh, a clinical um, phenotype, and this media um, shows how difficult it is also really to uh, identify and dissect all these different um, uh, compartments that, that are part of our of, a, of you know of an individual. So the way we decide to tackle um, the question of uh, studying the molecular cellular and molecular events. Um, in, in the case of intellectual disabilities was really based on a cellular uh, feature that is an hallmark of uh, um, several intellectual disabilities, namely the this, this structure, shape, and functioning of a synapse, you know, the, the contact uh, um, between neuron and neuron. And as you see here from this uh, slide, you see that according to which type of intellectual disability that could be a genetic intellectual disability like Alzheimer's disease or fragile X or Down syndrome, or even if uh, you know, we challenge uh, our brain later on in life uh, with alcohol abuse, malnutrition, and poisoning, still we may um, face this uh, spine dysmorphogenesis. So the spines can be longer, thinner, less dense or more dense. But the take home message is that there are events occurring within the spine that might be crucial um, in those apparently different disorders. And that's what the lab has really been interested in. So which are those events? So in addition to uh, the events that, that occur at a certain specific time, we also have to consider uh, the brain uh, is, is, is a long journey process, right? So um, there are putative lifetime trajectory of the dendritic spine number in a normal subject that you see here in black, uh, but uh, those trajectories are different in the case of uh, schizophrenia or in the case of um, Alzheimer's disease. Uh, so the bar across the top indicates the period of emergence of symptoms and diagnosis. So in normal subjects, spine numbers increase before and after birth, and then this period is followed by an elimination, a pruning, that occurs during childhood and adolescence uh, up to the adult level. So this is very important. It's a crucial moment where there is a synaptic consolidation, and as you may observe here, this phenomenon of pruning and, and synaptic elimination is affected in some of these uh, pathologies. Now, these pathologies that, uh, that, are, um, that share this uh, hallmark of spine dysmorphogenesis are called synaptopathies, and we will go back to this um, very soon. So um, my training is really, I mean, I was trained as a hardcore molecular biologist, and, and I was really, you know, working on, on, look, on protein synthesis, how ribosome work in the cell since many years. I did my PhD thesis on ribosome biogenesis, and I was really fascinated. I became fascinated by this theory that all these stewards and other uh, colleagues have really proposed back in the 80s 
um, uh, where they propose that highly polarized cells, like neurons, have evolved this very elegant way of regulating gene expression. Namely, a subset of neuronal mRNAs are able to exit the nucleus, assemble in specific ribonucleo complexes, and travel all the way down to the synapses. While they travel, travel they are translationally silent. And only upon synaptic stimulation, those mRNAs can be loaded into polysomes and, and proteins can be synthesized locally. Now, you see immediately the beauty of this uh, um, way of regulating gene expression because it allows uh, these highly polarized cells to respond in a very fast manner and also to make those synapses, in a way, independent to each other. So this, was, this theory was laid down several years ago, you, know, you see, but now it became very clear that genetic alterations of the molecular pathways implicated in the control of local protein synthesis contribute to intellectual disability and other spectrum uh, disorder syndrome. So this fine tuning of gene expression can really contribute uh, to um, those synaptopathies that I have mentioned. So once that theory was, was well received and many labs have been trying to identify which were those specific mRNAs that were dendritically localized, right? And, and of course here you see a picture, an EM picture, where you see the ribosomes in the synaptic compartment, and this was again another evidence that locally the, the protein synthesis could occur. So this um, uh, work from uh, the group of Erin Schumann was the first one where uh, she really took the molecular layer of the hippocampus where the um, um, uh, localized mRNAs and performed uh, an high throughput analysis and sequencing to identify uh, those that were uh, proximally and distally localized. And so we talk about several hundreds of mRNAs and they fall in diverse functional groups. So as you see here, so there are uh, mRNAs encoding for receptors, mRNAs encoding for uh, kinases, mRNAs encoding for a cytoskeleton removing encoding. So everything in a way that makes the synapses a kind of autonomous and independent and, and provides the synapses of this fast response capability. So here with the red arrow, you see some of those mRNAs that we in our lab have been quite intensively working on. So the PSD95, APAR campaign is 2 ARC, activity regulated cytoskeleton protein, MAP1B, and FMR1. Uh, so that's the mRNA encoding for FMRP, the fragile X metal retardation protein. And we will, you will hear a little bit more about that. So I mentioned at the beginning the RNA cytoskeleton perspective, and here again you see how those apparently different disorders like Alzheimer's disease, schizophrenia, and, uh, and autism spectrum disorders uh, share not only pathways, but in this case is protein translation, protein degradation, and active polymerization, but also molecules. And I think that's a little bit the message that I would like to convey today, is that you know, brain development and, and brain dysfunction, I don't see it as, as a compartmentalized process, but molecules that initially have been, for example, cytic one, linked to schizophrenia now that they are involved also in, in, in autism and maybe later on we will discover that they are also involved in aging. Um, and as well as APP, the amyloid precursor protein initially associated to Alzheimer's disease. disease. We know that it does much more than that. It has a plage, uh, plays a major role also during uh, development. So share pathways, but also share molecules. So the next big challenge is trying to identify the specificity of those molecules and the, and the specificity of their way of action, maybe understanding how the interactome is in a certain specific cellular population, in a certain specific brain area, and during development. So all of these elements make the complexity of our brain. So up to today, uh, we can say that over 100 brain diseases called synaptopathies are caused by mutations affecting the synaptic proteome. 
Furthermore, there are defects associated to ribosome function that leads to ribosome. So that's why we think that studying the fragile x mental retardation protein can really help us both ways, try to understand why the synaptic proteome is affected, but also try to understand how a ribosome that is not uh, working properly may also uh, contribute to intellectual disability. So uh, the fragile X is an x linked and syndromic form of intellectual disability. As you see here, so kids until the age of three or four really uh, do not show major signs of intellectual disability, so also the expression, but then later on, some clinical and imaging signs are clearly um, detectable, and uh, um, at, at the level of cognition and behavior, uh, it's a complex uh, uh, syndrome. Um, clearly, there is um, a decreased uh, um, IQ, so there is a developmental delay. Um, we all accept the idea that it is a neurodevelopmental disorder. Um, so it, it, a large proportion, I would say that maybe more than 50% of kids with fragile X have also autism. They also have attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, multiple anxiety symptoms, repetitive uh, perseverative stereotypic behavior, aggression and self-injurious behavior, and obsessive compulsive disorder. So this tells you that indeed we are not discussing only a developmental delay, but a much more complex um, uh, syndrome, and, and again, we need to dissect all these different components, the clinically, at cell, at cellular level, and the molecular level. But then, once we are there, maybe we, under, we can understand more also uh, pathways that do not go right in individuals with obsessive compulsive disorders or individuals who are aggressive, and so on and so on. At least, this is a little bit our dream as a scientist. So um, before uh, we go into the molecular part, I also would like to share with you um, how complex this uh, um, disorder is and, uh, and the fact that uh, uh, the gene involved in this disorder really may affect different generations. So I'm a biologist, I'm not a medical doctor, but I try to be close to, to the patient for many, many reasons that we can discuss later. And um, I, I spent, I did a short sabbatical in the, at the Mind Institute at UC Davis in Sacramento and had the pleasure, the privilege to work with uh, Rondi Agerman. Uh, I was an observer, so I served patients and we had several cases of fragile X and, and kids with autism. And to me, this was really revealing to understand more what was happening in the lab. And here, this is an example how the, the family is can be complex. So in this case, it was the boy who came into the clinic, uh, fragile X and autism, and then the little sister with mild autism. And then the mother had uh, anxiety, neuropathy, muscle, muscle pain, and then the grandmother's um, kind of neurodegeneration. And here I would like to point out that this, this fragile X, now called fragile X, tremor ataxia syndrome was really highlighted by, by Rondi many years ago and, uh, and was misdiagnosed for many years because, uh, of course, uh, those patients had symptoms of, you know, similar Parkinson, ataxia, tremor, so it was very difficult. And now we know that it's linked to the, exactly the same gene. And then the grandfather, again, in this case, fragile X tremor ataxia syndrome. So very complex, several generations. Why? How does it work? So let's start with the normal allele. So fragile X syndrome is called fragile X because of a discovery that was made by chance, as often it happens in science. And I'm not going to go into the detail, but it was clear that those patients with an inherited uh, form of intellectual disability, when their chromosomes were cultured in a certain way, there was a gap. And this was late 60s, early 70s, and then 20 years later the gene was discovered and mapped in this location. So that's why it's called fragile X syndrome. So if we zoom in into the gene, the gene has it's a very complex uh, exon, intron, alternative, slight isoform, but in the 5 prime UTR there is an expansion, CDG, which is polymorphic in the population. So normally the expansion goes up to 50-54, there is regular transcription of the mRNA, a regular synthesis of the FMRP protein. And here we have non-affected individuals. 
Then we go to the, uh, the other case, which is when the CGG expansion goes over the 200 rupees, um, and the promoter is silent because it is a mediation event, there is lack of ECMO-1 and absence of protein, and those individuals have uh, fragile X syndrome. There are also other cases where point mutations in the supran UTR or in other domain of the protein are, uh, also have fragile X. And then the intermediate allele, and this is just the case that I've shown you in the previous slide. So in this case, the expansion goes between 55 and 200. There is, a, there is a higher level of FMO1 mRNA compared to regular, you know, to individuals that are, who are not affected, and then a little bit decreased level of FMO3. And uh, in, a, in a good proportion of those cases, individuals develop the fragile X tremor syndrome as well as female, women, a premature ovarian failure. So that's quite a complex gene, and according to how the cyclone UTR region looks like or expands, it may lead to different uh, disorders, neurodevelopment or neurodegeneration. So the protein um, involved in the fragile X syndrome is an RNA binding protein. It has four different RNA binding domains, and this already um, makes a major statement because with four different RNA binding domains, we can imagine how many um, RNAs are regulated. So um, I would like to mention that uh, um, the gene uh, has been, uh, so that the syndrome actually um, has been identified initially, first described by Martin and Bell in 1943. And the gene was identified in 1991 as a joint and concomitant effort by several laboratories, including uh, the laboratory of Steve Warren, Ben Ostra, John Lumandel, Grant Sutherland, and David Nelson. So it was really a teamwork in Europe and in the States that led to the identification of, of the gene. And since then, many labs all over the world are really trying to understand the function of the protein, mixing or mutated in the patient, of the protein interactors, as well as of the mRNA targets of this protein. So um, what we think is that presumably this regulation of the mRNA targets causes the fragile X phenotype. And, and it's therefore really important to understand which mRNAs are controlled by FMRP. And I will touch base on that later on. In terms of function, as a classical RNA binding protein, FMRP touches all the aspects of mRNA metabolism, uh, mainly regulation of protein synthesis in the cell body, regulation of RNA transport in, in neurites, and the regulation of reshaping the synapses um, uh, in collaboration with one of its cytoplasmic partners called CITIS-1, and I will tell you a little bit more about CITIS-1. So here you may find some of your favorite uh, protein interactors of the fragile X mental retardation protein. As you see, they have been involved in, in different cellular processes, and this makes clearly fascinating, at the same time very complicated, the understanding of the function of FMRP in always think about cell type specificity, brain area specificity, and during development. So um, I would like now to um, briefly summarize uh, some of our recent findings. Um, as I mentioned, uh, fragile X really consider a neurodevelopmental disorder, and we know that uh, the development of the nervous central system encompasses a series of critical processes, including the production of neurons from progenitor cells, the correct migration, and the correct shaping. And when we started with uh, in collaboration <coughs> with a group of Carlos Dotti and uh, staff scientists in his lab, Annette Gartner, a two PhD student in my lab, John Jolafata and Nuria Dominguez, we really try to understand a little bit more if there were events during embryonic development that could affect um, indeed uh, brain development in the context of fragile X. Also keeping in mind that these are some kind of, you know, a little bit as I told you, um, complex disorders, in particular the first two ones. Um, I would like to mention that there is at least one clinical report showing that patients with fragile X have periventricular heterotopia. And, uh, and we, we know that 40, uh, 50 percent of patients of fragile X 
have also uh, ASD features. And there is also a little bit of psychotic aspect that is that they share. It's very complex, not all of them, and, and it really depends from many aspects. So keeping in mind or having in mind all this information, we really try to understand which of these process, and of course this is only the beginning, so I will show you some of our data, but this really opens a new uh, chapter how to uh, you know, address this fine tuning of neuronal development during embryonic development. So um, in this case, we really became interested to how neurons in the first step um, really uh, divide, um, migrate, change shape, adhere to, to, the, to the track that has the radial linea, and, and finally compose a correct uh, cortex. So those experiments were uh, performed and published, and you will be able to uh, to, to go into the detail of all the experimental setup, I would like just to give you a few highlights um, to show you that uh, um, indeed what we were able to um, observe is that the fragile X mental retardation protein regulates a very defined set during embryonic uh, cortical development, which is the multipolar to bipolar transition, MDT. So this means that during that step, um, the neurons in the case of fragile X that exit the interverticular zone to migrate all the way upward to the cortical layer are a kind of delayed. Yeah, that's very important. So we are not saying they don't migrate. They are delayed. But then at some point they make it. So there is a little bit of timing of where they think a little bit longer how to acquire their correct bipolar polarity but then they make it, and then they adhere to the radial glia cells, and they migrate all the way up. And, and of course, when we replace back FMRP, the phenotype was ameliorated, and this was uh, quite uh, an important observation. Having said that FMRP regulates mRNA metabolism, as you can imagine, we immediately went and looked for crucial targets during that specific embryonic developmental window. We, we set up a microarray uh, uh, using the RNA and then a course is at, at, at E14, E15, E16. And just to give you um, a summary of that, we have identified and in mRNA as a target of the fragile X mental retardation protein. We were quite happy that that was the okay, case because it was unexpected with the microarray. And the reason why we were happy because is that encadirin is an essential factor for multipolar to bipolar transition. This has been shown by the Justin Cooper's lab, by the Dottie's lab, in vitro and in vivo by many other labs. Um, it's required for correct morphology and orientation of newly generated neurons in the, in the cerebral cortex. And um, the Cadirin family has been identified by Everwine as part of the FMRP targets. And we uh, have also identified e Cadirin as a major FMRP target in cancer cells. So we really thought it was a very good indication that we were on the right track in a way. And indeed, what we could show is that uh, the mRNA of n is regulated by FMRP at the level of stability, namely in absence of FMRP, the level of n mRNA is lower. n mRNA is a target of FMRP, so we could immunoprecipitate the FMRP complex and validate that the messenger was associated to FMRP. And we could also show during actinomycin D blocking transcription that indeed the half life of encadenin mRNA in the absence of FMRP will decrease, really suggesting a role of FMRP in regulating encadenin mRNA stability. So we replaced back encadenin and we could ameliorate some of the cellular molecular deficit that we have observed. Another important data set that we obtained in collaboration with uh, Rhiannon Meredith at the University of Amsterdam was that the, the early postnatal brain networks are, uh, were affected in the developing F11 knockout. And, and this is what uh, was quite interesting because we know that the early postnatal stages is fundamental for brain development. Um, so um, brain uh, sections from one type and, and knockout mice 
um, corona section were loaded with calcium indicators, and then we, we monitored the number of active cells firing and number of events. And why, uh, in general, they go down during development, as expected, in both white type and knockout, we could see a difference in the case of the FMO1 knockout. So they still fire more than, um, than, uh, than expected. And those um, data sets um, were also confirmed and by independent labs, and there are uh, several groups that really show this difference in between um, um, uh, the, the firing of the neurons as well as uh, a, a balance between excitation and inhibition that occurs during the early postnatal life. And here you see, for example, postnatal day four or postnatal 18, when we checked that the omer uh, jeffrey punta we could see that the case in fragile X, this ratio is higher. And, uh, and other work also by the, the lab of uh, Ennis Contractor, Carlos Corsera, uh, Kimber Huber, Yana Meredith, uh, really uh, point towards this unbalanced excitation in vision, but also um, this increase in the um, firing of the cells in the early postnatal stages, um, in the early postnatal stages and early adulthood. So just to conclude that this this part, I would like to mention that this was all uh, quite interesting and exciting for us, but uh, we really wanted to understand because this minor fine tuning of the brain at the end had an effect on, on the uh, whole structure, right? So looking at all the layering, the layering was fine, but then we decided in collaboration uh, with the uh, colleagues here at the Mosaic in, um, in Kenya Leuven to look at the brain and uh, the diffusivity uh, of, uh, um, of those uh, um, uh, fragile X uh, brains. And what we could see using diffusion sensor imaging, we observe a reduced um, diffusivity, axial, axial and radial, in the cortex, which mostly represents um, structural changes in the fiber patterns and integrity. So this was a collaboration with Tom Dressler and Uwe Immelreich that had this 9.4 Tesla uh, for, for mouse work. And so this was quite interesting and, and actually it's, it's quite, um, uh, I was ha happy, I was interested in reading that also the group of Alan Wright has published recently um, a neuroimage clinical data set on patients with fragile X. Um, where the group of, uh, indeed observed um, there is an indication that this decrease that we observe in the mouse model is also observed in the uh, fragile expression. So take home message here is that um, we think that this MRNT, namely FMRT and RNA binding protein and, and the partners of the RNAs that, that work together with FMRT are the building blocks of the brain. Of course, this is a very simplistic way of thinking because there is not only FMRT, there are many other RNA binding protein plus all the interactors of FMRT. But let's think about these building blocks during prenatal life as well as during postnatal life that are fundamental for the correct development and, and wiring of the brain. So in the case of, of, of early embryonic development, uh, having FMRT place those neurons into a fast track so they can change in a correct timing the, the morphological shape from multipolar to bipolar adhere to the radial glial cells and, and migrate all the way up to the marginal zone. When FMRT is not present, there is a delay. So they, they need more time to acquire this polarity, but then they, they still make it. So which means at the end, the brain is, is, is there, but maybe there is a little bit of uh, wiring defect uh, deficits that uh, that is present, and that's what we have observed uh, uh, with the, with the calcium uh, imaging as well as um, with the MRI uh, technique. So I would like to shift gear now and and, and move towards events that uh, are also crucially regulated or dysregulated in the case of fragile X and possibly other disabilities during uh, uh, postnatal life. So, and, and I will discuss 
uh, um, uh, a role for the amyloid precursor protein uh, in, uh, um, in, in developmental uh, disorders like autism, uh, Down syndrome, and fragile X. Of course, in this uh, webinar, I will mainly concentrate on fragile X, but linking a little bit to autism as well. So I will not touch on the neurodegenerative function of ATP, but on the neurodevelopmental function of ATP. So um, why ATP uh, and why this interest? As I mentioned, um, several high throughput approaches uh, such as immunoprecipitation followed by microarray analysis, uh, clip RNA sequencing, antibody position RNA amplification have led to the identification of hundreds of FMRT putative target mRNAs. So I would say more than 1,000 in brain and more than 6,000 non-neuronal cells. Uh, overall, FMRT was shown to bind almost 4% of the mouse brain transcriptome. Um, but for all this, there is at least a, a, a core, a group of targets that has been uh, really um, highly studied and also uh, found dysregulated in many, in many labs. And ATP is one of those targets. So the color really goes also according to how many times it has been found as a target and how many times it has been validated. So we became interested in this function. And uh, I'm sure that I don't have to discuss uh, here uh, to, for this audience the pro in detail the processing of ATP, but let me just point out that, that ATP is a type 1 transmembrane protein, ubiquitously is expressed protolyzed during its intracellular trafficking, and over the last five years, I would say, many labs really became interested in this, the physiology of APP and not the pathology of APP, so it involves in cell differentiation, growth and survival, neuronal migration, synaptic formation, and function. And there are two ways that, that the cell can take into the processing of APP. The amyloidogen pathway that will lead to a beta, and we will not discuss this today, and the non amyloidogenic pathway via the Adam 10 protein that process um, ATP at the plasma membrane, liberating the CDF as well as the soluble ATP alpha. So um, what Manu and Manuela Pachu, the PhD students in the lab, did was first of all start with the developmental approach. So she collected brain at different stages of one type and FMA1 knockout and checked when, if and when, if we knew, because many labs, including ours, knew that at least at one specific developmental st stage, APP was upregulated in fragile X. But she really wanted to start you know, with early stages and go to adult animals. And as you see here, um, until the age of, uh, you know, P14, there is not this regulation, but then during, uh, you know, the, the, the end of synaptogenesis, in a way, um, the mouse model for FMRP has an increased uh, level of APP compared to one type. And this increased level stays later on in life. Uh, we then zoom in also at synapses. As I mentioned to you, this was really the beginning of our interest. So we prepare synaptoneurosomes, which are a pre and post synaptic compartment, and also at the level of synaptoneurosomes, as you see here, uh, around P21, uh, we observe this increase in ATP that stays later on in life. So, of course, at this point, we could say it's uh, you know, an excess of a beta or an excess of soluble ATP alpha. We didn't know. So what Manu did was to really um, detect uh, the A beta levels at these two developmental stages. So one is juvenile mice and one in the adult mice. And you see here the difference. The juvenile mice have less A beta, while adult mice and old mice have more A beta, um, uh, consistent also with findings from um, Westmark and Toad uh, group, so that uh, age fragile X animals have an increase of A beta. But now we, again, said that that's an interesting time window, and here we don't have more A beta, we have less A beta. So having more ATP is clear that the other processing should be or might be effective. 
And then we look at Adam Sand and the generate the soluble ATP, and soluble ATP. And as you hear, P21 and P30, so only juvenile animals have an increase of soluble ATP levels that later on is equalized and goes back to normal. So we have now identified a very specific pathway um, generated possibly by Adam Sand during a specific developmental window. So it is this soluble ATP alpha really causative of spine dysmorphogenesis, so contributes to spine dysmorphogenesis. The way we address this was in multiple ways. I will just give you one example. So here you see white type um, neurons, and here you see fragile X um, neurons, and uh, the difference is clear. We have an increase in the spine number, and we have also an increase of immature spines compared to mature spines. So what we did in this case was first to silence ATP, and then once this was done, we could uh, ameliorate the cellular phenotype because the spine numbers went down to normal, and also the ratio immature, immature. But now in a situation like that, if we provide soluble ATP alpha again in the media, we go back to the dysmorphic phenotype. So increase by number and increase immature spine. Really uh, strongly suggesting that is the soluble ATP alpha the effector of this um, cellular phenotype. So um, of course, this now calls to the next step, right? So if there is more soluble ATP alpha during synaptogenesis, in a way, the enzyme involved in this uh, processing, Adam 10, should also be present uh, uh, in excess or should be more active. We didn't know which one of the two things was. So what we could see during synaptogenesis, indeed, Adam 10 is upregulated. So you see here also the immunofluorescence. So we did it by Western block, by immunofluorescence, and by many other assays. So we could show also genetically um, that really is the uh, increase uh, Adam 10 ATP pathway during synaptogenesis that liberates an excess of soluble ATP alpha that is involved in all this um, um, cellular phenotype. We went one step forward then, and with um, a great collaboration with Monica De Luca, who had back in 2007 identified a peptide that in a way um, um, was uncoupling the, the, the translocation of Adam 10 to the plasma membrane. And this is great because the peptide doesn't switch off Adam 10 activity. That's a very important aspect, but decreases the Adam 10 activity. And that's exactly what we were aiming at, not to shut off an enzyme, but to decrease the excess of activity of that enzyme. So that was the case. So we used this peptide uh, that you see here. It works like a dominant negative, interferes with the relocation of Adam 10 and activity of Adam 10. And we use that in vitro, um, ex vivo, and also in vivo in the old animal. And we could see that indeed the peptide had an effect at the level of synapses in synaptoneurosomes, also um, in the media of the cells. So the, the increase of soluble ATP alpha was reduced. And um, one of the hallmarks of fragile X and also other intellectual disabilities is an excess of protein synthesis. And uh, we know that there are several specific proteins that are upregulated in fragile X. One uh, of the classical, uh, uh, or the first, it was uh, identified by us back in 2003 and, and later on by the group of Eric Klan, Kimberly Uber, um, Worley, many other labs really show that ARC activity regulated cytoskeletal protein is upregulated in fragile X. And as well as, in this case, now ATP, Adam Pan, stepped by the group of Paul Lombroso. So these, these are really a core component of the synapses that are being regulated. And upon treatment of uh, uh, the, the mouse model for fragile X with this peptide, we could observe a, an amelioration, namely those excess protein synthesis goes down, uh, it's, it's equalized, and also some specific proteins normally dysregulated are not dysregulated any longer. 
Um, and finally, just to touch base, so we also wanted to monitor behavior. Um, and uh, not all the behaviors that we tested were actually ameliorated, and that's what what we do expect, right? Not everything is ameliorated because this is a, a specific pathway during a specific developmental window. Uh, so we checked open field anxiety and activity, teammate working memory, and that's building social interaction, and that's an example. And the door three were indeed uh, ameliorated upon the treatment with the peptide. So that, that's really quite promising. And together with the rest of the experiment that I'm not going to discuss today, I would like just to summarize with the next slide and show you that what we believe is happening in the case of the early postnatal stages in Fragile X is a, is a complex of events, but now we have identified a specific pathway during synaptogenesis, which is the ADAM10 APP that it, so both proteins are, both mRNAs are targets of SMRP, both proteins are upregulated in absence of SMRP that controls their uh, translation. This pathway uh, liberates soluble APP alpha that signals to the m -R and leads to an excess of ERK activity that then leads to spine morphology, uh, affective long-term depression, and behavior. So if now we can ameliorate this pathway during a specific developmental window, I go back with specific developmental window because I think it's crucial, then we can ameliorate those deficits. And that's what we actually did using the mouse model. So uh, we are quite optimistic that that's one of the ways to go to ameliorate fragile X. And I would like to point out that while we were working on this, there were two reports, one showing that um, um, patients with autism uh, also had an excess of soluble ATP alpha. This was monitored through blood. And then also patients with fragile X had excess soluble ATP alpha from, uh, from in blood. So what we did was to take a, a group of patients uh, with fragile X primary fibroblasts, and also in that case, we could see that APP and ADAM10 are upregulated, and we could also observe an excess of soluble APP alpha. And now let me just make uh, a remark here. As you see here, if we take the two groups, control and fragile X, there is a clearly significant difference between control and fragile X. But there is a bug that I would like to underline. There is a distribution. And maybe this is something that we have to think about, because maybe not all fragile X patients are the same, right? And this is not MAB. We know that that's uh, not the case. So I think the next step would really be try to identify specific biomarkers and also think uh, you know, on making different cellular and molecular subclasses uh, of those patients so that the next step of, you know, targeting and amelioration could be uh, made at persona eh, with a specific uh, uh, molecular profile. So I will, I will now um, uh, shift gear again and tell you a little bit more about the synaptic plasticity. And I mentioned that one of the uh, role of SMRP is uh, controlling mRNA translation, and, and also uh, cooperate together with these interactors, cytip one in reshaping the synapses. So cytip one um, so, the, so I'm going to just go to the next slide. Um, so cytip one is for cytoplasmic SMRP interacting protein, initially identified by Kaibuchi's lab um, in Japan back in 1998 as a specific RAC1 um, protein. Uh, and then the group of Jalou Mandel, with whom we collaborated, um, identified uh, with the 2 uh, that site uh, as a cytoplasmic FMRP interacting protein. Now, what we did over the last 10 years is really show that the fragile X mental reservation protein cooperates with site one in regulated protein synthesis. So cytic one is a, a act um, um, has a dual role. Maybe we'll have also a third role, but for now has a dual role. Uh, the first one, uh, the first not in terms of discovery, but in the first in terms of drawing, is to bind IF4E and uh, regulate protein translation. Namely, 4EBP, they put a break 
to protein synthesis. So cytokine is the neuron of ADP, and together with FMASP, regulate repressive MRA translation of synapses. Now, if we remove FMRP or if we remove cytic one, we have an excess of protein synthesis. The, the second function in the cartoon is that cytic one, and this has been uh, shown by many labs uh, all over the world, um, that is involved in actin remodeling. And uh, actin remodeling collaborating with the wave regulatory complex and actin rack leading to um, active polymerization. Now, what, what we showed, this was the work of Silvia de Rubey and, and with the help of Ma, Emanuela Pasciuto to a series of, you know, in vitro uh, and in vivo and ex vivo approaches that in these both processes, like a regulation of protein synthesis and actin remodeling, are necessary to lead to a correct spine morphology. So if we touch any of the domain of cytic interacting with the wave regulatory complex, or the domain of cytis interacting with Cori, we face spine dysmorphogenesis. So spines are long and immature, right? So coordination of these two processes is essential. But now, how can this um, occur? And, uh, and, and this was crucial, a crucial contribution of one of the postdocs in the lab, Daniele Di Marino. So what he could show starting with the crystal structure that Michael Rosen had published in Nation back in 2010, is that in this site it uh, has two conformation, as a planar conformation, but also a globular conformation. Now here, um, the movie is not playing, but you have to see that this was an 135 nanosecond simulation, and you could see that there is a change in conformation that was validated in collaboration with Daniel Choquet, as well through fat analysis, so that really the protein is able to change conformation. These two uh, conformations are part of two different complexes. So when it's planar, regulates actin remodeling, and when it's globular, binds for E, regulates um, local protein synthesis. So the shift between planar and globular, between actin remodeling and translational control, is mediated by uh, activity. That in our case, we uh, mimic, in a way, activating the tract receptor or the, or the um, angular uh, fire receptor. Um, um, later on, uh, the group of three Bram, with you, whom we collaborate, was also able to show something quite I think, interesting also the way we think about learning and memory, you know, that is not really one only phase, but there are several phases, and those phases are reflecting molecular components and the shaping of the synapses. So in this case, what he could show is that um, uh, in a way, uh, long-term potentiation mediated by activity and BDNF track B signaling pathway could be divided into early translation and late translation. The early translation is regulated uh, through link one that act is active on the site of FMRP for its complex. The late translation is regulated still through link one, but then that acts on general for EDP. So we have an early and late according to which type of 40 BP the cell uses. And then this, of course, implies that there will be different targets also regulated according to the um, early and late translation. So I mentioned to you at the beginning that those uh, deficits, in a way, uh, schizophrenia, fragile X, uh, neurodegeneration, and so on, are a little bit linked. And those evidence uh, are provided more and more, have been provided more and more over the last uh, few years. Uh, but, uh, but we, in a way, independently, using the mouse model, were quite surprised. Uh, from uh, having found that the cytic one interaxon, and this is the word that Sylvia did in collaboration with Gu, uh, Gu Smith and, and Kawan Lee in uh, the University of Amsterdam, so what they were able to show uh, also through the analysis that Daniel Postuma helped us with is that two-thirds of the cytic one interaxon, here you see FMRP, one of those proteins, is actually associated to schizophrenia, to autism spectrum disorder, to intellectual disabilities, uh, to major depressive disorder, and also to Alzheimer's disease. 
So the way we, in a way, think about it is that uh, FMRP and CITES are part of a complex. So this complex uh, uh, may be affect, uh, affect, affected in, in ASD, but in also in schizophrenia. And here you see another disability, such at least some of the papers in which uh, FMRP has been implicated also in schizophrenia. A low level of FMRP has been associated uh, linked to patients with schizophrenia and so on. So again, bringing to the context over and over of shared pathways, not only during neurodevelopment, but also during um, neurodegeneration. And uh, the last few slides that I will, uh, data that I would like to share with you now is one specific aspect that, uh, that we are very much interested in. So you're seeing we go from really hardcore molecular uh, neuroscience and then more and more how this may have an impact at the level of disease and, and the patients. And, um, and CITES really seems to be a hub for this different in, in, in disability. So the gene maps on chromosome 15Q, and between breakpoint 1 and breakpoint 2, this is a chromosomal region quite unstable. So usually we face duplications and deletions of breakpoint 1 and breakpoint 2 that contain CITES 1 plus additional genes that you see here in the map. And a few of those notions are already out there that I mentioned binds RAC1 quite one in more than polymerization, regulate translational control, is crucial for the really component synaptic development, microduplication and microdeletions contain inside it, segregate the cognitive disability and autism, and provide susceptibility to ASD and classical autism, and as well as predisposed to generalized epilepsy and schizophrenia. So you see that we are touching on several disabilities, and so that's why I really would like to convey to you this um, uh, uh, snapshot and take on message uh, a little bit psychic and trick, uh, uh, where we think that psychic is a hub for different intellectual disabilities, so according to which RNA binding protein it binds to, and which RNA, a subset of mRNAs it regulates, it may contribute to different disabilities. So one aspect that some of those disabilities, and in particular autism have, is social interaction. So here you see a cartoon with, with several aspects like inability to relate to children, uh, to children or adults, uh, um, inappropriate laugh, laugh or crying, oversensitivity uh, to noises, to, to touch, and so on. So it's a very complex symptomatology, and the, uh, at the moment in, in the lab, we are really trying to understand at least some of these aspects. Like that, we would really to understand all of them, but we start with some. So one aspect that I will point out to you today is how we can study social interaction and how we can identify the circuitry and hopefully ameliorate that aspect. So um, the way we, we go is, is, again, as I mentioned to you, is using uh, both uh, mouse and, and fly model. So the mouse model is the the cytic, um, heterozygous mouse. So cytic one is knockout is embryonic lethal. So we work with the cytic X. We have performed a battery of experiments. I'm not going to go through the detail of them, but this one I think is, a, is again, it's a, it's a hallmark for, for social interaction, which is, um, which is the three-chamber test. So in that case, we monitor the head time uh, of uh, uh, a mouse, uh, one type and so less a cytis that that faces a chamber with a mouse or an empty chamber. And as you see, of course, that uh, a well type mouse is more interested in a stranger than in an empty um, compartment. Uh, in the case of the cytip S, this difference is not there. So the mouse is not able to discriminate between the two. But there is a bug that I would like to point out. After training, for example, those mice do quite well. So even the cytip S mice, after some training, are able to behave like the wild type mice, uh, considering what is a stranger, what is stranger one, and what is a stranger two. So training helps. So this is, there is a plasticity there that can still be tackled and, 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 and reshaped. 
And then uh, the next few slides are really to, uh, and this first data set that I showed, this was the work of a postdoc in the lab, um, Ana Rita Santos. Uh, and then we, we switch here with something that we had recently established in the lab. So it was Alex who set up the slide model in the lab. And I'm sure that all of you know that uh, the Drosophila is a great uh, genetic model organism, has been extremely uh, useful for the genetic detection of developmental and anatomical traits. It's, it's a model system for human disease and largely used also to mimic behavior. So in this case, uh, what Alex has set up is really the way to study social interaction in flies through uh, two paradigms. One is uh, um, um, competition for food, and one is courtship. So since uh, the time is clicking, and I don't want to uh, go over many details, I can tell you that he has a, a set of um, fly models for ASD, including the Fragile X model, and as you see here, those fly models are really affected, have affected behavior. So they are less engaged in, for social interaction, both in both paradigms of, of competition for food as well as courtship. And I skip uh, the videos to go to the um, almost uh, final slide, which is uh, um, what I would like to convey is where, where we go now from those paradigms. So we have, we have uh, a behavioral essay. In Drosophila, we can switch off all the receptor um, pathways in a way, in, in, many, in several ways, identify which one is involved. For example, in this slide model, we could see that the GABA pathway is involved. So the GABA origin transmission is crucial for, for that social interaction. So what we can do is provide GABA through, through food, as you see here, so we can monitor the, the slide that has, that has been fed. Uh, feeding with GABA through the blue belly, and then we can ameliorate uh, those deficits. And of course, this is just a proof of principle, but because we are now in the process of, uh, um, of screening several compounds and trying to dissect the circuitry, uh, the molecules behind the circuitry identify compounds that could ameliorate that. And, and this is just a very brief summary because I would like you to to go over if you are interested to the clinicaltrials.gov where there are at least more than 50, more than 45 clinical trials, some completed, some ongoing for fragile X. So, so the field is very active. As you see, there are ways to downregulate excessive um, glutamatergic uh, transmission or support and upregulate a decreased GABAergin transmission or go more specific on some uh, molecules, as the ones I mentioned, that are upregulated in fragile X. So again, I would like to thank the team that is actively working on, on this topic that I mentioned and on, on many more that I didn't have time to uh, discuss the funding agencies that uh, have provided an, an outstanding support um, to our lab during uh, the last years, uh, the collaborators with whom we uh, discuss, um, learn, exchange, team up, and, and we look forward to continue to collaborate with all of them and, and, and many more. Uh, the alumni uh, that have contributed over the years, some have already their position as professors, some they are successful postdoc all over the world. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. And I'm ready to take questions. Hi there. Um, so we just have time for one question, and it comes from Chuck Hansel. Um, he asks, are there circadian differences in the S APP alpha levels such that part of the reason for such a broad distribution of SAPP alpha in Fragile X syndrome is timing of sampling? Yes. So the question is that that's also one of the things we are investigating at the moment, the circadian rhythm. I can mention that Fragile X patients as well as biological models for Fragile X have circadian rhythm uh, 
problem. At the moment, we don't have evidence yet that the soluble ATP alpha in those patients uh, follows the circadian rhythm uh, deficit, but that's something that we are currently investigating. Okay, great. Um, with that, we're going to wrap up. Um, so thank you for participating, everybody. Thank you, Professor Barney. Um, a complete replay of this webinar is going to be available on the Spectrum News site um, in a few days. And this is part of a monthly series, so please stay tuned for our next talk, which is going to be Brian O'Rourke on April 27th. And on the website, you can also find an archive of all of our previous webinars. And thank you again, Dr. Bagney, and thank you all for tuning in. Thank you, Claire. Thank you, all of you, for tuning in as well. Thank you so much. <laughs>